Okay, so now we're recording, right? Okay, we're recording. Goody, so welcome everybody. And uh, spring, when I say spring has sprung, it's supposed to be 90 tomorrow. Somebody said it was gonna be 90 tomorrow. It was cold this morning, but, but the water temperature rose really quite dramatically in the in the last week or so it, we're up to um we were at 69 degrees which is which is pretty warm and oysters are just growing remarkably fast over at the marine center all the overwinter oysters showed a remarkable amount of new growth just a huge fingernail it's more than a fingernail it's like a a claw of new growth. So uh, everybody's really happy with what's what's coming out of the uh, overwinter stock. So we're gonna, you know, we're gonna start um, coming out of actually next month is configuring the garden, but but basically, it, folks that have been doing this for a while, we know the routine. This is a great time to take your win, uh, wintered oysters out of hibernation and clean them up and get them all set up and they're, they're growing very well. And we do have new seed uh, all, already. So we're gonna just talk about, you know, for folks that have been uh, sticking with these Zoom lectures and I've been told that people are really enjoying them, uh, which is nice to, to know. Um, we started with algae culture because we needed algae. I'm, I'm actually, uh, I'm very impressed that with myself. I'm gonna, wait, watch, there I go. I'm, I'm impressed with myself because when I give these, these talks at the time I give them. Oh my God, really, I think this one's open. Oh, careful with the, uh, you might all wanna mute and when you wanna talk, unmute. Chips. That yeah. way we don't hear when you're stepping on your, your partner's uh, tail there. So, uh, Every time I give these talks, it's about a topic that we are actually in the throes of doing, like these maintaining nursery culture systems. That's exactly what I do. I go in in the morning bright and early and I maintain these systems because, you know, this whole thing that we're doing with raising oysters and aquaculture is, is really quite, um, it's, it's very seasonally uh, demanding. So in other words, in January, we needed to culture unicellular microalgae. In February, we needed to condition and spawn shellfish. And in March, we needed to raise the larvae. In April, we needed to have that larvae being set. And now we're no longer in a, in a hatchery phase. We are now in, in entering the extreme nursery phase. So that's what we're gonna talk about now. And what's important about that is when we define a nursery, the way I like to define it is that uh, we are no longer needing to feed these things our cultured microalgae every day. Okay, in the hatchery, all of our stock had to be fed seven days a week with unicellular microalgae that we had to culture because there really wasn't a lot of wild algae and the water's cold and all these things. And let me tell you something, I, I, we're all farmers. We're all farmers at different levels. Uh, when you have to slop the hogs every day, you know, and, and the good news for me was I lived in East Hampton. So I had other people doing it for me that lived, you know, four minutes away. Soon I'll live four minutes away and I'll probably have to do seven days a week again. But, uh, you know, you, th these things need to eat. They're animals. They need to eat. You can't just say, well, it's the weekend. Uh, they'll, they'll be fine. I'll just, uh, I'll feed them on Monday. This is a seven day a week feeding thing. And as soon as the water temperature comes up and the algae concentration comes up, uh, you can put them on ambient flowing seawater with plenty of algae in it, and you no longer need to feed them. So you might say, wow, that's great. So you don't have to do anything anymore. Well, uh, you do still have to maintain things. So we're gonna look at that, but my, that's my real designation about the difference between hatchery and nursery is that now they're on auto feed. Now it's a, what's, what's really important about that, and you're gonna see this, this, almost this entire talk is going to be about 
kind of one simple concept, which is water flow, okay? And actually, um, so what we're doing is we're taking, we're taking this new spat, which keep in mind, I love it when people come into the nursery or when they ask me, is seed ready yet? Because I can walk them up to a, a, a silo of, of new spat and pick up oysters that are the head of a pin. And they say, yeah, sure, here, here's your oysters. How, you know, got a shot glass? You can have this shot glass. Of, and uh, there are other oysters from this year's stock that are about the size of dimes already. And so, as you all know from growing your own oysters, they don't grow at equal rates. But, uh, you know, when I say we're culturing up small oysters into bigger oysters, some people walk in and they're just blown away by how small these things are. And I'm used to them when they're microscopic. So, I mean, to me, nothing is that small. I don't know if he's muted everything. So basically we're, re we're, we're trying to get these, these oysters up to a size where spat members don't feel that they're going to lose them or they're so small and so fragile. So I like to get them up to, you know, about, I would say 14 millimeters or something like that. Pretty good size. And, and, and that we're well on our way to having everybody get, get nice, nice size seed. Um, so what you're going to see now, and I don't think I have it in this, I don't think I have it in this talk, so I'm gonna I'm gonna mention it right now. There's a there's an equation about it's a very broad brushed equation. It's called the Seston flux equation, and the Seston flux equation states that algae concentration times flow equals growth. Very simple kind of broad equation. But what I love about that equation is uh, algae concentration. When we were talking about the hatchery, we can, we can manipulate the algae concentration because we're growing the algae, we're supplying it. We know how much we can give them. So we can actually look at that part of the equation. Uh, algae concentration times flow. And so you have to provide flow to allow this algae to get to them equals growth. Well, in nature, now that they're on ambient flowing seawater, we can't control the concentration of algae. That's controlled by nature. So right now, at this time of the year, and I don't know if you've been out on the water or looking around, but the water's starting to take on a pretty nice color right now. It's a, there's a lot of algae in the water. So that algae concentration is, is increasing. So we've got our algae concentration. Now we're gonna look at flow rate and we're gonna look at it. I could, I, could, I, I, I could equate this to nature to say that if you were living in an area where there's a tremendous tidal flow or you're at the, uh, you're, you're, you're at the, the mouth of a, a creek and it's really flowing. If anyone lives on Goose Creek, boy, it flows a six knot current there. There are places where the current is running really strong. That's flow, that's natural flow in and natural flow out. So if you've got good algae and you've got good flow, it's gonna to equate to good growth. So what you're gonna see when we're talking about this, the rest of this talk, uh, we're, we're going to manipulate the flow part of this, this seston flux, flux equation. And, and just to follow through with one other concept about this, in nature, the algae concentration uh, Do you kind of hear any of oh, this? Somebody's, somebody's not muted, so be careful. We can hear everything you're saying, and some of it is really inappropriate. You should behave yourself when you're on these. No, I don't care what anyone does. Just if you're walking around naked, you should definitely mute your video. <laughs> okay, how's that? Uh, the, the algae concentration has a really high concentration in the spring, and then in the summer, 
a lot of times uh, the microalgae concentration really kind of dips down and you'll see this macroalgae start to grow and use the nutrient. And then in the fall, that microalgae concentration comes back. So this natural flow, uh, algae concentration part of the equation uh, is dynamic and we call it actually bimodal. High in the spring, high in the fall, bimodal. So those are the times of year where you're gonna see you know, tremendous growth. Right now is one of them. Okay, so for, we're gonna talk about upwellers and we're gonna talk about downwellers, just so you get an idea of uh, what these pieces of equipment are and, and, and you know, what their function is. So what happens is if you were, if you went to last month's lecture, we talked about how uh, larvae, has a certain, there's a, oysters have a larval stage. And, and as they get to be about 14 days old, this is in the hatchery in nature, it might be three weeks, 21 days old. As they get to the end of their natural larval cycle, they're going to become what we call an eyed pedivelature. And all that means is that they've, they've gone through their larval cycle and they're ready to undergo metamorphosis and become spat. So they're going to go from a larval stage, which is, by the way, is uh, planktonic, swimming around and, 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 and kind of drifting around. And what we would call um, planktonic or submerged, uh, uh, emerged to metamorphic, uh, post uh, set or metamorphosed, where they actually set cement onto structure. And then they're what we would call benthic, bottom dwelling. They don't, that's it for them. If they sit on a rock, they're on a rock. If they sit on the bottom of a boat, well, maybe they get to move around a little bit, but you know, they're stuck to the bottom of the boat. Uh, that's what bottom paint's supposed to keep them from doing so that you don't have, you don't have uh, oysters all over the bottom of your boat. Uh, if, they, if they cement to another oyster, they're on another oyster. And that's where they are for the rest of their life. So what we do is we provide little tiny shell chips for them to set on what we call microculch. And the microculch allows them to cement to a tiny shell chip. And what I do is I, I have the shell chip so it's 500 micron, a half a millimeter. So when the oyster is one millimeter, you can't even see the shell chip. It's still there, it's always there, it's cemented to it. So it's, it's there at the very tip of, of, of the hinge is the tiny little shell chip it's set on. But then it outgrows that and it just keeps growing. So it looks like it never stuck to anything. Okay, so that's what we do. And now we're gonna take these tiny, tiny critters that we can handle carefully and grow them into bigger, uh, bigger critters. So what we use is what's called a downweller. And a downweller, the way that it goes, the, 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 the description of a downweller is that water is flowing down through the animals that are on. This thing is showing you a, a plastic, I call it a silo. It's made out of it's fume duct pipe, plastic, PVC. And on the bottom, this blue that's inside here, there's actually a screen there. And I can tell from this slide that it's 315 micron only because it's written on the silo, 315. 315 micron screen on the bottom. The animals are sitting on top of it and water is being flown, flowed, flown, <laughs> flowed from the top down through the animals, through the screen, and out the bottom. That's a downweller. So it's going like this, down, 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 down. And depending on the configuration of your tank, if it's ambient flowing seawater, it's going down the drain. So you're gonna pump water in, in, in with a pump, flow it down, and out the drain. If it's a static tank, you would set up a pump and it would just circulate down and through, down and through, down and through. Okay, that's a downweller. And the reason why we use these downwellers is because the animals are so small that you have to put them on a fine mesh screen. So in other words, if you've got a 400 micron oyster, you would put it on a 300 micron screen so it doesn't go through, especially the diagonal. And 
you want to obviously if you put a, a small animal on a large screen they go through it I mean, it's pretty straightforward but the problem is when you're doing this that screen can clog very easily so you can't provide a lot of flow to this thing and i'm going to give us as we're talking about this thing uh this this talk about these nursery pieces of equipment i'm going to i'm going to give it an arbitrary uh, um, rate of flow. So let's say that the downweller were providing one gallon per minute flow. Okay, so we're gonna call a downweller one. One gallon per minute flow is flowing through here and out. And the animals are small and we're trying to get them bigger. Everyone's following that so far? Good. So we can provide the flow with a couple different things. An airlift tube is a fascinating uh, piece of equipment because it's this complicated piece of equipment called uh, a PVC coupling and a chunk of PVC and a PVC. It costs about, this right here would cost maybe about I don't know, 48 cents. And you stick a little airline in there and water pumps. So what it does is it you have an air supply and if you have a compressor running, the bubbles will lift the water up the pipe into the silo and it goes down. It's a really wonderful, it's a, the first thing I ever saw in a hatchery was an airlift tube and I was like a changed person for the rest of my life. It's like, that's appropriate technology. I tell you, a 59 cent piece of equipment that pumps like a you know, like, like a, a real pump, you do need an air supply, but if you've got an air supply, uh, you, it can go a long way in providing water flow. And by the way, you know, even if you're in a static tank and you're feeding these things algae, do you need to keep moving water around? I mean, they're sitting in a tank, you dumped algae in the tank, aren't they gonna eat the tank? And oysters are fascinating critters because they filter so dramatically that if you didn't provide the flow to, to this silo, let's say you filled up this tank and it was dark green and you left it without flow. If you came back an hour later the tank would be dark green and inside the silo would be crystal clear because the only way that algae would get in here is from the bottom through the mesh and they, they filter it much faster that osmosis would bring algae into this thing. And I've seen it, it's really fascinating. It'll be crystal clear in here and dark out here. So you have to provide, and if you go back to the Seston flux equation, this is really complicated math, so follow me. Algae concentration times flow equals growth. If algae concentration is, is 100 and your flow is zero, what's your growth? Theoretically, it's zero. Anything times zero is zero. Same thing as you can have all the flow in the world. You get up 100 gallons a minute flow and no algae. What's your growth? Zero. So you have to provide this flow in order to have this system work. Here's a picture of, of, a, of, of a tank full of silos with airlift tubes. And I say, is this, a, is this a hatchery, a piece of equipment or a nursery piece of equipment? It's kind of a, it's kind of a combo. I would still call it a hatchery piece of equipment if you have to keep feeding them. And th in this case, we had to keep feeding this because this was not, there was no new water coming in. There was a heater here. We'd fill, we'd fill this up and, and, and with heated water, dump in the algae that we've been growing. And now if you look at these silos, they say 150, that's 150 micron. So these were really tiny. This would have been one and two and three day old post set in really fine downwellers. And so you have to do that. Do you not giving them any? This might be in February, Maybe, but not here in March. Okay. Uh, for for uh, another application, especially for scallops, we can use uh, downwellers with a filter bag with ambient flowing seawater. So we're pumping water in into the uh, the system 
and it's going through filter bags to take the big stuff out, the, sh literally the shrimp and the copepods and things like that, but allowing the algae to flow through. So that still would be a downweller because it's going from the top mm -hmm. out through the bottom. So the water flows from the creek, unfiltered mm -hmm. through the manifold and down these pet cocks that can feed and you can put a filter bag under there. We use that for scallops. We're gonna try scallops in the next couple of weeks. If anyone wants to try spawning scallops with us, we should be able to do that maybe the first week in June. We're there Monday, Wednesday, Fridays in the morning, if you wanna come by and, and, and look at that. So now that these, let's say these, these uh, oysters have grown to a bigger size, uh, now we can switch from a downweller with very fine screens and fine animals to what we call an upweller. And what happens with an upweller is raw, unfiltered seawater is pumped from the creek. It flows into the tank. And when the tank fills up, if Watch this, here's the tank. There's a cork in here and a cork in here. There's no standpipe. So when water fills here, how does it get out? Well, there's holes in the side of the tank. And here's a cup, it could be a cork or whatever, a, a stop, rubber stopper that blocks some of these holes. Let me get this, I got my toolbar right in my way. I'm gonna move this toolbar. Let me get this toolbar out of the way. You can't see the toolbar. Okay, so water's filling into this tank and how does it get out? Well, right here and here, oops, somebody's not on mute. I can hear what you're saying. Dinner's ready, it's burning, I heard you. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I can mute everybody, hold on. Uh, mute all. Oh, you won't stop. So I'm trying to mute you. Hold on. Where is it? Down in your corner near the mute button. If I'm not down wrong. in the corner near the mute button. Is it here? Yeah, here it is. Thank you. Uh, I don't see it. Oh, well. Everybody quiet down there. Okay. Sorry, I'm going to learn how to mute. Or it's the three dots next to your screen. There's three little dots, and it might give you an option to mute all. Sorry. Uh, and uh, when does Walker graduate? Uh, I don't see it. Oh, well. If And Darcy's not here, unfortunately. She had to go to her daughter's, her granddaughter's confirmation. Okay. Anyway. Oh, and I went too far. So... When the tank fills, the only way that water can get out are through these openings in the side of the tank. And so if you take a silo, I call this a silo. This is 800 micron screen. It's got a screen on the bottom. Now the only way water can flow is up from the bottom of the screen through the animals and out. And so water's coming in, unfiltered. You can see the color of the water. It's nice and dark. And, and it's going up and out, up and out in a single pass. It's just running 24 seven, flow in, flow out, water up from the bottom, the animals eat and it goes out, single pass. Oh, I've got to find this darn mute button. Uh, somebody direct me, where remote participant. If you roll over your own picture maybe, it says, it might say mute. Oh, there, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, mute, that's mute mine. Where's mute everybody? Ah, in, rename, I don't see it. Gosh darn, oh wait. That was you. Kim, if you can make me the host, I'll find it. I run Zoom all day, every day. Okay, how do I make you the host? On the participants list, look for Paul Carson. And then the three dots next to my name. Okay, thank you. Did I do it? 
call. Where to go? You you muted me, but you didn't make me the host. Okay, hold click on. the three dots to the right of my name. Yeah, I'm trying to find you. That's correct. We got him in my Okay, now you're right at the top. Where the heck are you? Well, here you go. I and uh. Trying to find my cart cursor now. Okay, I'm having issues here. Well, they're investing. They're investing in Walker. <laughs> well, it, it is just. Oh, oh well. Gosh darn it. Anyway, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm in. Uh, uh, oh, here we go. Hang tough. Get this out of my way. I'm not sure why I'm having such a hard time with my screen here. Oh, well. It also could be down in your bottom where it says participants, chat, all of those. Well, good, good to hear and enjoy the graduation. Uh, oh, there it is. Thank you. Gosh. Okay. And if you want to come back on, I guess you guys know how to come back on. Okay. Sorry about that. Now we're all set. So, so you get the general drift. If now remember when we said that a downweller was, we're gonna, we were gonna call it one, one gallon per minute flow. When you go to an upweller, and this is a two horsepower pool pump and it's pumping and it's filling these tanks. We're now gonna call the flow rate 10. We went from one gallon per minute flow per silo to 10, an order of magnitude. The water flows quite strong, fills the tank, comes up from the bottom of the screen with the animals in it, out the gutter in a single pass 24 seven at a flow rate of what we're gonna call 10 gallons per minute flow. So you can already see from that, that we've, with that Cesson flux equation, We've now theoretically, remember it's a broad brush equation, but have theoretically increased the potential growth rate by, ten, by, by an order of magnitude tenfold, okay? And the truth of the matter is uh, you can see that happening. Uh, right now, it's a very exciting time. I come in every day and backwash these, these oysters and you can literally, see them growing. I mean, it, it, they, they, when I leave them in the afternoon, I come back in the morning, they're not the same size. And it's fascinating to see how fast that happens and how much they poop and how much you have to clean them and backwash them. If anyone wants to get involved with that, every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, we're there from, you know, eight to noon, and you can get involved in this hatchery maintenance. It's not difficult. It's actually quite, quite a lot of fun. And, and, and I'll show you why in a minute. So what we have here is also an outflow screen for a couple reasons. Uh, as the tank is filling with water, right here you can see some air bubbles. Sometimes it's because the pump is charging. You have to be careful how the pump, how well it's sealed because if it's not sealed well, it'll cavitate and create uh, okay. kind of effervescence and bubbles. And what happens is the bubbles can actually get underneath this screen and Sometimes it'll build up and build up and then it'll bur literally burp, it'll go burp. And these little oysters, there's quite a bit of flow rate, can, can kind of volcano up. And if you don't have an outflow mm. screen, they'll go right out the drain. And so we keep, those, <coughs> keep that from having the oysters leave the system. And this is just flowing 24 seven and it's being fed natural algae. And that's what's called an upweller. Okay, and we make our own equipment. Uh, th these are just 24 inch fume duct type pipe, <laughs> mesh 200 <laughs> micron. You must write on the silo uh, what the mesh is, or else Ooh. you know it's a little chilly time. How did you unmute, or are yeah. you a new participant? Well, so when you're doing well, I can eat while watching this. Yes, but you're on not muted now. How? Where did my thing go? Oh, here it is. Where's my mute all again? 
Okay, I just, I guess I have to keep muting as you're coming on, but I, but, but you're all welcome. I'm, I'm glad we got 26 people on board here. That's fabulous. All welcome. And I'm glad you're all eating because as soon as I ditch all of you, I'm going to eat too. No, I'm kidding you. We could stay here all night long. So we build these ourselves. You must write them on here because I tell you, if the, if the writing fades, you're never gonna know what this mesh is unless you can look underneath a microscope and determine what, what the mesh is. Do you need to know what the mesh is? Well, the fun part about all of this, let me see where I'm, I am in the slide. So here's a kind of a, this is an old picture uh, of the nursery. We've improved it. We got rid of a lot of this, these, uh, these raceways here. We have two banks of these tanks. It's a, a little neatened up in here and the fun part about this part of the operation, I said to you that oysters are growing, like you can practically see them growing. But more importantly, you can see here, this says 600, this says 800. There's some that might say 1,000 or whatever it is. As these are getting to be a bigger size, you want to get them off of this fine mesh onto, onto greater mesh to keep them from clogging and it will allow for more flow through there. So very, almost, almost every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I go through these oysters with my various amounts of sieves and I sieve them by size and keep moving them up into bigger and bigger containers, the uh, mesh sizes. Now I wanna ask everyone a question and you don't have to answer, you don't have to, un uh, you can raise your hands or you can flap. When you were a kid, did you ever get from your parents that little sieve set, one was yellow, one was green, one was red, and you'd go to the beach and you'd take a bucket of sand and you put it in there and you sift it out. And on the top, you'd get all the Rolex watches and the band-aids and the cigarette butts. And the next one down, you get some kind of coarse sand grains and stuff like that. And you got to the bottom and it was this this beautiful sugary sand. Well, I never got one of those sets as a kid. And, uh, you know, I, I guess I took it personally. So now as a, as a young adult that I am, uh, I have a tremendous sieve series. I got a sieve series that any kid would be envious as all get out. It goes from like four millimeters to 18 microns in every dimension. And what I call this operation is panning for gold. Because when, you're, when, when, when you have newly set oysters on microculture, there's a lot of shell chips in there. And then as you're sieving them and they're getting bigger and bigger, you're getting rid of all that culch and all that's left is pure oysters. And as the oysters grow, now you're taking a one millimeter sieve, a 1400 uh, micro, uh, one millimeter, uh, which is a thousand microns, 1400 microns, so 1.4 millimeter, or whatever it is, two millimeter. Uh, and you keep sieving these things and you're getting, you're sizing your oysters. And once you size the oysters, the, the, the other fun part about it is you size these oysters. Let's say you went through all of the oysters in the whole system. And we're talking maybe a million and a half oysters. It's not like you're doing 20 oysters. You're doing, you know, a lot of oysters. Now you go through the whole system and you've got them all sized by, let's say these are two millimeter, these are 1400, these are 600. You can take a volume and then you can take a, a, a sample like a one milliliter sample, count the sample, multiplied by the total volume and get a rough idea of how many animals you have. And we do this all the time. This is part of ma maintenance in, in the nursery. We write the tags out. This was one liter of oysters at one millimeter. Uh, there were 35 per milli milliliter. And so you have 35,000 oysters. And it's really simple math. It's kind of fun. I, lo I, I love it. I've been doing this for many, many, many years. And I still really enjoy this part of it because you can see how fast these oysters are growing and you kind of know how many you grew that year. I, I, I don't have a total count yet at all. I'm, no, I'm nowhere close. I don't, my eyes are too, uh, I can't see anymore. And I refuse to wear glasses because 
then I'll look really old. So uh, not trying to knock anybody that's wearing glasses that I'm telling you, you look old. Because uh, I'm not. But for me, I don't wear my reading glasses. So I can't count, I can't count uh, 800 micron oysters. It's just too painful. And I won't make you do it either. But if you want to get in, in, involved in this, it, it's, it's actually quite exciting. I think we've counted all the big stuff and we're up to like 400,000. But most of the oysters are tiny and, and are hard to count. We backwash, this is an old picture of, of this is now our algae room. Uh, this was the old upwellers and uh, one of my early summer interns and uh, backwashing every, every, pretty much every day with fresh water right through there with a nice fine spray to get all the, you know, drain the tanks, backwash all the oysters because they, they, they metabolize a lot. They really build up a, a, a lot of sediment in, in even a day. It's, 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 it's a good sign because it means they're eating well. Uh, we can collect them, we can size them, we can count them, we can clean all the equipment, keep everything nice. We, can, we use uh, different cleaning materials and keep them nice. Uh, we make our own equipment. That's Roger Cornell making up some silos. So if you wanna make some silos, we do that. We made all the tanks too. We made the hatchery, we made, SPAT did all of that. If you, if you don't wanna just learn how to grow oysters and you wanna learn carpentry, come our way. We build the boats and stuff. Now, we talked about, we talked about uh, a downweller. We talked about a static tank downweller, which was you fill the tank with heated water, you feed it microalgae when they're really small and you downwell. Then we talked about putting the downweller on ambient water and they're getting a little bit of 10 ga one gallon per minute flow of ambient water. Backwash it, keep it clean. They got a little bigger, we shifted to an upweller. We increased the flow rate by tenfold. Now we're giving them 10 gallons a minute flow. 10 gallons a minute flow, theoretically they're growing 10 times faster because you're giving them more algae per, per minute. And once they get to a certain size, you can go to the next machine, which we call a flupsy or a floating upweller system. And this thing, I tell you, is really quite an astounding piece of equipment. And again, I mentioned before when I was talking about the, the airlift tube, about this concept of appropriate technology, which is, it's not high tech, it's not low tech, it's appropriate tech, it works really well. Well, the Flupsy, is one of the most appropriate tech pieces of equipment I've ever seen. And uh, we, we've been building these for, I've been building these for 26 years. And we, this is kind of the, this is, this is like the, 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 the uh, oh, another participant. I'm gonna mute you. Let me back up a second. Oh, I went the wrong way. So, this looks just like a dock and a bunch of planks and a bunch of uh, 55 gallon drums with some floats in the top. Well, really that's about all it is. It's really quite a simple uh, piece of equipment. And the way it works is this, you have water coming in. This is a kind of a weird diagram, but you have water coming in, it fills up your, your container, comes up from the bottom, through the seed and out. Upweller, same thing. But what we do with this, uh, and we build these boxes and we build the, uh, the, the things, we build the barrels. What's wrong with that picture? I know who that is, by the way. And this is the new, the new design, all aluminum. It's got doors and it flips open. And what I, I don't know, do I have, uh... hold on a second. What's funny is, I gotta back up and explain something. Right here, 
This is uh, not very good pictures, but the best, all, always the best way of doing, uh, learning any of this stuff is to come by and see this and, and, and help maintain it in person. This center part here is a 12 inch sewer pipe. And in the 12 inch sewer pipe are four inch uh, uh, PVC pipes sticking in there. So it's a manifold. And it's got, this is two machines, 10 barrels here and 10 barrels here, sealed at this end. And on the other end is a one horsepower ice eater motor. And when you plug it in, water is, fills the center through the four inch PVC, but because we have a, a barrel in the way, it's gotta come up from the bottom of the barrel where the oysters are and out in a single pass. And the difference between this and the, the land-based upweller is this is sitting in the water. So there's no what's called pumping pressure, head pressure. And the flow rate now goes another order of magnitude. These won't actually get 100 gallons a minute flow, but they're getting somewhere along the order of 40 and 50 gallons a minute flow. It's really phenomenal how much flow is going through this system. And basically your force feed, it's like, it's like making oysters uh, foie gras. You know, you're just feeding these things, stuffing them in 24 seven of as much algae as they can eat. And you can really see these things take off. I've logged in a thousand percent volumetric growth in 10 days. So that means I put one liter of oyster seed in a barrel and 10 days later, it's a 10 liter bucket and it blows your mind. It's like, it, it, it's really striking how fast they'll grow at this time of the year. So if anyone wants to see this in operation, just come on by the, the center on a Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And, you know, this is the real Tom Sawyer part of my life. I'm enticing you to come out and do our maintenance for us. But, and you'll love it, you know, bring all your friends and we'll, they'll all love it too. And we'll get it done. So, and if you want to help build them, we, we don't really need to build them anymore because as part of the governor's project, we built 70 of these to grow 70 million clams. And that, so we have, we have a bunch of these now. Um, there's a whole uh, thanks for your interest kind of write up on, on what these machines are. If you start seeing them at your local docks uh, these are the floating upwellers that we that are available for nonprofits and 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 community groups. If if you want to get involved in this, we'll be uh, setting these up in a, in a lot of places in in the next couple of years. On the uh, I would say this is on the west coast. You know, some when when the advent of the floating upweller uh, became a reality to to oyster growers, they realized the firepower of this nursery system that could literally grow millions and millions of seed in pretty clo close proximity. I can tell right now, this is a beautiful rig. I don't know whose it is. I think I just grabbed this from, from, from uh, the internet. But a couple things about this. This is run by a paddle wheel. That's a paddle wheel. So it's paddle wheeling the water through the system uh, to create the flow, a very expensive rig. I mean, they've got these electric gantries for lifting up the, here's a, here would be their silo. It's this huge thing here and they drop down square and you had, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, and it goes all the way down here. If you provide enough flow, I mean, this, this machine right here would grow millions of seed, millions and millions of seed. And, and, you know, in this close proximity, this unit would cost a lot of money to build right here. You're looking at, you know, a lot of money. Ours are, I love ours because we build ours for, for, for pretty cheap. I, I can build these things for remarkably cheap, but they don't look quite as combat as this one. Uh, but I don't know if I would want something this high end where I, I rather have, 10 uh, of the ones that we built and, and have, you know, some, some resiliency. If this, if this um, 
if this paddle wheel goes down, where's your backup for that paddle wheel? I mean, you know, there's something about this that is almost asking for a little bit of trouble. So uh, it's not really my style, but it is a beautiful rig. Uh, here's another one on the West Coast that I like as well, because this one is so remote that behind this garage door, no doubt, is a diesel generator that's generating the flow for this machine and for the gantry and all this stuff. Because it, these people grow stuff where they're nowhere near any power supply. So they're, they're running these things uh, totally remote. I have seen online, if you're interested in looking at, at something uh, that was designed a long time ago, it's called the Blake, um, uh, uh, what, what is it called? It's called the Blake Tidal Upweller. And it, so this one is unpowered, it's totally off the grid and it's using uh, just tidal flow. I think it's just on a mooring swinging around and it's catching, it's catching the flow as the tides come in and out and it keeps shifting as the tide goes out, it'll go 180 degrees and catch the flow through a flume. It's really, a, the guy that designed it, Blake, uh, was an engineer and, and there's stellar pictures of it. I don't think anybody's, built one and operating anymore because they were kind of expensive to build and they, they didn't really work anywhere near as well as if you can have a, a 110 outlet and just plug in an ice eater because that, that nothing beats that. So, um, oh, okay. So let me uh, stop sharing. And uh, hi, Dave. A and so if anyone has any uh, questions, uh, you can unmute, ask questions, or anything you want to do there. I can. Yeah, I have a question. Hey, it's Chris. Not, hi. It's not clear to me why you have to start seed with a downweller. Why can't you simply go directly to an upweller with small seed? E excellent question. Thanks for, for, for asking that. And the reason why is this. You remember how... Uh, I should I should go all the way back, but I'm going to have you picture this. Picture the downweller with with very fine mesh on the bottom, very small animals on the bottom, and you're filling from the top. Can can animals ever get out of that thing? How would they ever get out of a configuration like that? And it's a bit of a trick question. And the answer is the only way they could get out of that, and this happens, let's say that you're flowing ambient water into this fine mesh. And it's, uh, remember that it's unfiltered, okay? It's not filtered seawater, it's unfiltered. Because you don't really wanna filter seawater, you'll filter the algae out and you don't want that. So now it's filling this fine mesh and you're, Picture your freeboard. I really should go back. Hold on. I'm gonna. I'm going to share my screen again. Am I? And I'm gonna go. Uh, can I go back? Yes. Are you still? Can you still see this? Uh, can you still see the thing? Are you picking up on that? No, just your face. Oh, didn't I share the screen? Where am I? Uh-oh. What have I done? Okay, hold on. Uh, share screen. Oh, I see why. You see that now? Now, yeah. okay, now picture this. Water's flowing down here on a fine mesh. You see this right here? This is your freeboard. Here's your water line. Here's your plastic. Can, can, can water ever get out of that? It can if it clogs and you're gonna see this rise, the water level's gonna rise, it's gonna rise, it's gonna rise until it flows over the top. And if you had scallops, they'd swim right out. Maybe the oysters won't get out. But what happens is uh, the screen is so fine. If you had an upweller, not only would that, screen clog up, but keep in mind now 
that with an upweller, you've got this outflow screen to keep animals from getting out. That outflow screen would also have to be really fine and you're gonna get clogging and the whole thing is just gonna not work for you. Now you could run an upweller with pretty fine stuff like 400 micron, which is pretty fine. You can do that, but you're gonna be maintaining it a lot more. You'd have to make sure that you were backwashing it religiously every day or which I do because this morning I came in, what you'll see is this silo will actually lift up out of the water on a tilt because it's so clogged and water's flowing up from the bottom, but it's, it's like a, uh, it's like a wine skin. I don't know what it's like, it, but it, it's got no pores in it anymore. It's completely occluded by all the silt and whatnot, and it'll lift right up and that'll stop the flow altogether. So uh, that's why. So uh, on another note, to answer your question, by, by screening them and sizing them, the trick is to get them on a coarser and a coarser mesh so that you won't have that happening, so that you'll get tremendous flow through here all the time, okay? I also didn't really mention that when you're doing this, you, you see right here, and I'm not going to say this in a derogatory way, but you see the white in here? I call that bald spots. You actually want this screen to be 100% covered by animals because what will happen is water will flow and channel through these openings faster than they will through here. So you're not getting even, even feeding potential. So there's some tricks to it. It, you really, the, the toughest part about nursery culture is getting these small animals to grow big. And now I'll tell you something, in the last week, they're taking off. Now, now everything is going great. So you can coat this bottom really nice. You've got nice coarse meshes. I just took everything off of the smallest mesh this morning. So now everything is on uh, greater than 600 and most of it's on one millimeter and eight barrels are in the floating upweller. So they're quite large and it's fascinating to watch. I, I'm telling you, I mark this down on a little orange tape just so I can look. If I said that uh, on Wednesday, I put two liters in this barrel, next Wednesday, it could literally be 10, 10 gallon bucket. And, and you've got to see this to, 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 to believe it because it's really is quite fascinating. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing again. And here we are. Any other, any other questions there? No, thank you, Kim. Well, listen, everybody, we're one big happy family and I'm looking forward to seeing everybody We'll take care of everybody this year. Everything is going swimmingly. If you have any issues or problems, including, by the way, if you were away all last year because of COVID and you have oysters at the Marine Center and you haven't tended them, don't worry about it. Come on out. We'll, we're, we'll get everybody squared away. We'll take care of everybody except for Dave there because, you know, Dave's always in my face. You know? <laughs> No, I, I love you, Dave. You know that. So love you come as on, well. Come, come on out. We're having we're having a good time. I, I'm looking forward to seeing everybody. Things are really coming alive in a big way. Uh, you know, on another note, right now we're still maintaining the masks on in front of the mukti mucks anyway. Uh, you know, I told the SPAC guys, if you're all vaccinated and you're working outside and you want to take your mask off, you know, we're going to get through it. We're following the protocols that Andrew Cuomo and others, we, we can't even follow federal guidelines. And it's very confusing to people I know. And there's a lot of people, including my wife. My wife didn't get sick this year. She's a kindergarten teacher. She didn't get sick for the first time in 20 years. So she said, I'm wearing the mask for the next three years. I'm not, I'm not giving it up. And so I'm fine with whatever people want to do. Um, but I, I do want to have a safe environment for us all. And I, I, you know, we never stopped coming in. So I think we, and nobody got ever got COVID at our place. So 
we're in good shape and and i wish everyone the best and i know i'll be seeing everybody seed will seed will be there's a there's a partial share of overwinter seed especially for folks that are watching and that come to these videos if you want overwinter seed i can give you a partial share and then the new seed should be ready by i'm going to say again first come first serve for the biggest stock starting the in, in the middle of june which is a couple weeks early okay there's plenty of seed all throughout the season everyone's going to get their seed but if you want to come by early uh, and look me up that's fine too we'll take care of everybody Okie dokie. And, and uh, for the Tiana people, Tiana is up and running. Uh, the docks are in. I'll be, I'll be going there this Tuesday. I'll be there in the morning this Tuesday. Uh, and probably every Tuesday for eternity. I don't know how long eternity is, but we'll get everybody squared away at, at Tiana too. Okay? What time on Tuesdays? Uh, well, it's going to be a little different because I used to leave from East Hampton to go there. So now I'm going to be leaving from Southold. It might be about the same. I'm going to say, let's start with 830. I might, my pent up energy level, I might be getting there at seven. I don't know. But let's start this Tuesday. I'll be there at 830. And uh, I'll be running lines. I don't, I'm not really bringing a lot of oysters out there. I want to, I haven't even been out there yet, but you know, the other thing is that everybody that grew last year at Tiana, all the oysters are at the Marine Center. You can come by the Marine Center. Anybody that was growing at Tiana and your oysters are at the Marine Center. If you come by South Hole, you can see, if you haven't been there, you can see the place. We'll take your oysters off the line. We can get them all cleaned up and in the cages there. We can do whatever you want. We have a lot of equipment there, makes it really simple and, and it's kind of fun. So, and it's helpful for me too. I mean, the other op option is gonna be, I load the trailer with dirty nets and bring them over to the Tiana. And, and now, now you're there uh, uh, out at uh, Peconic on Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays. Yes. From eight from, to from eight to, well, eight till you, I get rid of you guys. I mean, if you're there till midnight, that's, I guess I have to do that, but you know, no, we, we, we get it all done. We have a lot of, I have a, I have a slew of pressure washers. I'm trying to get power out to Tiana dock because we've been using the electric pressure washers that work fabulously. I've gotten rid of the, all the gas ones. The electric oh. ones are running great. We have four of them running at the Marine Center. We got the uh, cement mixer tumbler. We've got the regular culling machine. So I, I, I highly recommend for folks to come to the Marine Center, even if it's just for the one visit. And, but we'll, we, it won't be just a visit. We'll get all your oysters in gear. So if Kate and I came out Wednesday, we should be able to get ours clean and be able to take them back to Tiana on Wednesday. That, that's the other thing is that if you came Wednesday early, you could have them clicked on to Tiana by noon. Okay, thank you. Okay, good, good. Sounds like a plan, and I'm sticking <laughs> to it. Okay, did hey, everyone hey, finish? Hey. Today? <laughs> now it's my turn. Okay, Kim, Kim, hi. Sorry, not wanting to hold you back from your dinner. Oh, no, no, so, I'm, I'm teasing. I don't, I don't, I never <laughs> eat anything. I got my dinner right here. So. Yeah. The, um, all right, okay, very healthy. What uh, do you have an idea of what sort of loss, uh, um, loss come mortality you have through these stages? Aside, aside of kind of times when disease well, is finished. Well, it, 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 you know, unfortunately, or however you want to look at it, we're farmers. And, I, and I'm, I say that because I just got a call from a commercial guy who was going through his, his stock and he lost a, phen a phenomenal amount of his oysters this year, maybe like 60%. Now, so if you're wondering how much mortality you get through the winter, very little, because they don't die in the winter and actually people did very well. Uh, I've, I've seen, sometimes it's a function of how, how well you maintain them. Because I've seen SPAT members get, well, there was one SPAT member her first year that got 104% survival. What? 
Well, because you're supposed to start with a thousand oysters, and when she did her count, she had a thousand forty. You know, and it's like okay. Mm. So obviously, you did it volumetrically, but you know, I thought that was hilarious to have a hundred and four percent survival. Uh, you, you know, I would say, in general, typically, uh, if if you were getting sixty percent survival, you were still doing really well. In nature, you it, it, survival of oysters is pretty bad uh, with the numbers, uh, but. If you get the reason why I say we're farmers, every cohort of oysters can be different. The health of the seed going into it. Oh my God, Teresa's back in town too. Um, th so you might, you know, uh, you you can never tell how how hardy the seed is going to be until you're you're on your way. Now the good news is that there's a, if you look at your SPAC contract on the bottom in really, really, really tiny, tiny writing is the, this little, little warranty that says, if you screwed up, we'll take care of you. Because we'd like you to grow oysters. So if, you, if, you, if you kill all thousand of them the first week, you can still get another thousand of them, but you can only use that part of the little clause once. And then, <laughs> and then we brand you a knucklehead. And, and, we, and, 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 and I say that, but here's what happened one year. A new SPAT member comes. It wasn't you, Dave. I can say this. Okay. A new SPAT member comes, picks up his seed. He goes home with them. He calls me the next day and he said, I think all these oysters are dead. And I said, well, you just got them. You know, it, it's, this was Monday. And, and he had picked them up on a Friday. He said, I think all these oysters are dead. Well, well how could you, uh, what, what, how do you know? He said, well, I put them in my garage in a bucket of water and I left them for the weekend. And, and I thought, <sighs> yeah, okay. So on the bottom of your contract, it said you're allowed to be a knucklehead once. And we gave him another thousand, but the worst thing you can ever do with an oyster. I had a guy today, he's, he lives in Montauk. He wanted his oysters uh, this weekend. So I still live in the Springs. I picked up his oysters. I threw them in the trunk of my car because it's a Cornell car. It's not my car. I threw them in the trunk of the car. I drove them to Springs and I put them in my shed, but I didn't put them in water. Because if you put them in water, they're going to suck all the oxygen out of the water, and then they're going to suffocate underwater with no oxygen. If you left them out in your refrigerator, they're good for like a month, and they won't die. So there's certain things that you want to make sure you don't do, like put them in fresh water over mm. the weekend, you know, to purge them, and put some. Some people say they put a. Uh, 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 corn flour in with it, whatever. Okay, but you only get away with that once with me. And then, but you do get away with it once. Mm, so mm. to answer your, this convoluted answer, we're gonna take care of you. And if you can get 50% survival, you're still doing fine, but we'll mm. also give you some more oysters. So you have a nice batch. Mm. Okay. okay, 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 great. Um, well, one more question. In, in, so in the, the um, in the hatchery, you're, you're, um, um, you're, oh, you're hold feeding. On. Let, me, let, let me back up and really answer your question for another second, mm -hmm. because I think I know okay. where you're coming from, because you're more analytical than, than I'm giving you credit for. I know where you're coming from. <laughs> the highest mortality that you see is at metamorphosis. Okay. So when they're going into metamorphosis, if you have a million larvae, you might only get 20% survival at metamorphosis. That's the most extreme mortality that you're gonna see in the process is right at metamorphosis. Now we can look at that experimentally and try to make that better. So now the next step, as they're growing bigger, your mortality, if you're doing things right, shouldn't be that high. Like really almost like 95% survival, mm. okay? Now, when you get your seed, if you're coming early and you're getting nice hardy seed, you can literally, if you treat them well, you can get upwards of 80 and 90% survival. 
Okay. Okay. Because because they've gone through some of their most trying time. Now, I, there's caveats. If there's a harmful algal bloom, all bets are off. If there's uh, yeah. if if you're getting some kind of predation because of some way you're growing them, all bets are off. But they don't die in the winter now, but they could die in the spring if you have disease pressure and it was a mm. warm winter. Warm winter, this, when, that, when that oyster grower called me and he said he had that kind of mortality, the first thing I thought of was possibly dermo because we've been having relatively warm winters and that's not good for, oysters don't like warm winters. Humans like warm winters. Oysters don't like it warm. The, the disease pressure is much higher for dermo, which is in our oysters. We can work around it, but a warm winter coming into a warm spring, you'll see higher mortalities of overwintered oysters, especially two-year-old oysters. Okay? Okay, 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 great. Um, thanks for thanks for that. And so the, the other, other bit separately was it. So it, it, in the hatchery, you're um, you're you're feeding size selected algae, microalgal species to um, um, in the, the, in, the, in, in the hatchery when you're growing microalgae, you might have numerous species that are of different algal compositions for the phases. So in other words, mm. day one larvae can't eat some of the algae that we grow. It's too big. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so for instance, for oysters, just to let you know, a diet would go like this. From day one to day four, they would eat a two micron brown flagellate, either T iso or pavlova. That's two micron brown algae that they'd eat yeah. for the first four days. Then after that, you might be able to add a, a, a diatom, like ketoceros or something like that. As they get into day 10, you can add some of the green tetracelmus to them that's bigger. But you have to know what you're feeding them because if you're feeding them stuff that they can't literally filter, then you're actually going to starve them because they can't ingest it. So you have to know what the algae is and you can tailor it to the size of the critter you're feeding. Mm, yeah, so, it, so, so when it comes to um, um, the upweller systems, yeah, you, the, the utilizing whatever's within the, 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 um, um, the seawater, how, how are the young oysters then selecting suitable well, they, food. They, they, first of all, they're big enough to pretty much take in any microalgae at that point, except for, maybe okay. chain, except for maybe a chain diatom, which can be very large. But the way oysters work, and if you look at the internal anatomy, they actually have feeding palps that will grade the, 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 the intake and sort it like a conveyor belt. They're using their gills, which are ciliated, to bring them down into feeding palps that actually sort. And so anything that's okay. too big, they'll spit out in what they call pseudofeces and then ingest what they can. So they do have a sorting mechanism. Okay, great, thanks. Good boy, that's, now we're getting into the, we're into graduate school now, okay? We lost like all the people that can't can't handle science have all left. So good. Anything else? How do we do? Everyone's happy. Good, good. That's great. Don't be strangers. <laughs> Look me up anytime, and my email's always on. So if you ever have anything else you want to chat about, just drop me a line. Thank you so much. Great. It was incredible. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Ken. Great. Have a good night. Good, good. Bye. See you. Great weekend too. Thank you. Thanks, hey, Cindy. How's it going? <laughs> I love your background. <laughs> look at that. Boy, I want to live there. Where are you? You look like you're in the land of the jolly green giant. <laughs> ho, ho, ho. <laughs> hey, Andrew.
Good. Look Corey, at all these people. I want everyone to come out of the woodwork and come and play oysters. So remember <laughs> that whether you're working or not, you must come out and smell a rose or two occasionally. Okay. <laughs> Have you been, Kim? Very well, thank you. We're good, moving, good. We're, we're moving this weekend, so we're, we're oh yeah, you're to uh, South Pole. Yeah, yeah, we're very excited. Oh, that's great. So that's it. You're giving up the springs. Yeah, it's gone. We're, we're in the house with no furniture. We're sleeping good on for, a blow up bed. <laughs> Is that right? It's awesome. <laughs> I feel like good for you. That's that's exciting. Oh my! I better yeah, stop record. recording. Hold on, I'm recording. <laughs> <laughs> that's really exciting.